Amen. Thank God for the children this morning. From um, Book of Isaiah, Chapter Forty Nine. Verses 14 through 16. The New King James Version translation. Why y'all trying to find it? How y'all doing? <laughs> Amen. I'm well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Y'all still turning, y'all still turning, Isaiah <laughs> reinforces why we need to come to Sunday school and Bible study. And you don't have to try to cheat in the concordance there or in the table of contents. Old Testament, that's where it is, it's back there. Chapter 49, beginning with verse 14, but Zion said... Lord has forsaken me, and my Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hand. Your walls are continually before me. Amen. Amen. This is my Bible, God's holy word. It is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The grass withers, the flowers fade. But the word of our God shall stand forever. This is my Bible. This is my weapon, the whole, uh, the sword of the spirit. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. Surely they may forget, yet I would not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hand. Engraved on his hands, engraved on his hands. Divine judgment had come upon a people who had discarded their allegiance to Jehovah and I had abandoned their fidelity to him alone. Because of their waywardness, the verdict would be carried out by a people whom God would use for this purpose, the Babylonians. Israel's rejection of Jehovah and the covenant between them resulted in their being carried off to a strange land, Babylon, and dwelling there for 70 years. With the prophecy of judgment being now fulfilled, the prophet in this text is addressing an audience that has experienced life as chaos. <clears throat> Babylon was now home for Israel a land in which the language, the culture, and
and religious practices were all foreign to them. Here in Babylon, they recalled the sacred center that had formerly held together an ordered universe. The concentric circles of institutional structure that had unified the various spheres of human activity into a harmonious whole, namely the temple in Jerusalem that was now destroyed, the royal court, the priesthood, and commerce, all of those things were now gone. Residing in Babylon, they remembered how there came rushing into Judah to fill the void. There came looters and worshipers of foreign, of idol gods, foreign armies. They were all coming to tear, tear these people from their homeland. Finally, as foretold by the prophet, one morning the people of God awoke, woke up. They woke up to see the sun rising not on the hills of Ephraim, but rising on a land where Marduk and Nabu were worshipped. Confusion swamped the consciousness of many, and even when prompted to continue life as they once knew it, their melancholy response was that they could not even sing a song of Zion in this strange land. Life for these people no longer had a center but came to resemble the chaos that surrounded them. And any life and any people without a center will take on the shape, the culture, the behavior of the environment that it finds itself in. <clears throat> An uncentered people is a hopeless people. An uncentered people is a wandering people. An uncentered people is a disheartened people. An uncentered people is a lost people. An uncentered people is void of cohesion and innocence of God and community. The prophets among them who were assigned the task of preaching to the exiles came with a message of hope. They were told to, told by God to announce that the day of deliverance was at hand. They were told to announce that their homeland would once again be occupied with their presence. The end was nearing for them as alien residents in a strange land. And the land promised to their forefathers would once again be called home. However the, er, however, the earlier promises of deliverance from bondage and a return to the homeland, those promises hit the contradictory realities of the world in which ruthless tyrants refuse to release their captives. So nothing in their immediate world was changing. 
And the promises of God were falling upon deaf and cynical ears. However, it was to these demoralized and dejected people that the prophets strove passionately for the preservation of the community from cynicism and despair. He preached with the conviction that life is not driven by arbitrary forces, but is guided by a loving God who remains true to his universal plan of justice. This proclamation was desperately needed to rekindle hope. For in Israel's mind, the loss of native land could come to be attributed to the powerlessness of their God to secure the safety and the security of the nation. So through this process of re-evaluation, the Jewish community could easily lose its religious identity. And because its identity as a people was inextricably tied to its religious roots, extinction as a family that descended from Abraham and Sarah could rapidly follow. However, the task of convincing the people was vexed by serious problems. Many of those in exile were convinced that cosmic forces more powerful than Jehovah determined destinies. Others, so paralyzed by their despair, abandoned all hope for the end of captivity. And yet it's still for others. Opportunities for economic prosperity within the new land came as they were permitted to engage in commerce. And that prosperity could now be credited to the gods of the new land. And yet it was to these people. The prophet comes with a message from God. Describing himself who, like a mother, cannot forsake her young. He said to them, but Zion said, the Lord, this is what they said, the Lord has forsaken me. And my Lord has forgotten me. But the reply was, can a, can a woman forget her nursing child? And I had not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Although the word of hope had come to them from God, despondency had captured any thought of restoration. So therefore, to the message they replied, the Lord has forgotten. The Lord has forsaken. The troubles and trials of God's people have in the past and will even today move them to assume that he does not care. The seemingly uh, abandonment of divine care creates a vacuum of love and evokes emotions acquainted with grief as well as feelings of desertion. And this emotional and spiritual vortex, this whirlpool is what Israel is occupying. It is a space that has tuned out the word of promise as they plummeted into an emotional 
psychological and spiritual abyss. That abyss, that gorge, was a confining place. That, that abyss was a restricting place. It was a constraining place that makes no allowance for hope to be revived and faith to be rekindled. The space in which Israel resided was not fantasy nor fiction, but it was a spiritual and emotional reality as they grappled with the apparent madness of it all. And so therefore, I wish two or three of y'all help me. Therefore, because of their angst, it mattered not what the prophets said. For in their mind, they had drawn conclusions to which there were no alternatives to claim. They said, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. Now, before we move too quick to judgment, how many times have we co-signed these very sentiments when our worlds have come crashing down on us? How many times have we, like Israel, issued an indictment against God for his seemingly abandonment during critical times or crisis moments in our lives. We are all guilty of entertaining at least, if not beholding, to the notion that God has left us in a time in which we needed him the most. However it is in those moments that we need to trust in the promises of God and not our uh, proclivities and perceptions. We need to trust in the promises because he said in his word in Psalm 37, I've been young, the psalmist wrote, and I'm old now, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. And then over in Psalm 94, he wrote, The Lord won't leave his people, nor give up his children. And then in 1 Samuel 12, it says, For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake. So moreover, since God is not a man that he could should or would lie. It is in those moments, in these moments of questionable care that we must lay claim to what he has promised us in his word. <laughs> Nevertheless, Israel's response to the prophet, to the message of deliverance and restoration was, the Lord has forsaken me and my Lord has forgotten me. Now, as much as this was the mindset of Israel, it was a charge, an allegation that was far removed from the heart of God. The response of Israel, uh, their despair, was a word that reminded them of their own commitment to love. God drew an illustration of maternal love to illustrate how much greater divine love compares. He laid forth an illustration noting human expressions of love, however great they may be, they merely pale in comparison to divine love. Because he asked the question in verse 15, can a woman forget her nursing child? and not have compassion on the son of her womb? In one regard, the question is rhetorical. Can a woman forget her nursing child? It's rhetorical, rhetorical in that 
none that has given birth, none that has brought into existence new life can forget that which is a part of them. Can I get it with you? 